to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast, where we explore the gospel that Jesus' earliest disciples heard and what the last several decades of historical studies have clarified about this first century Jewish message. Listeners, welcome back to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. I'm Josh Hawkins, and as always, I'm here today with Bill Schofield and with John Harrigan. Hey, hey guys, how's it going? Good, man. Hey, man. Be here again. Good. Yeah, always great to be with you guys. Listeners, of course, it's great to have you on another episode here on Season 3. Today, we've got a good one for you, uh, but just a quick review from last week where we talked about Leviticus. We spent some time talking about one of the least read books, typically, in the evangelical world, arguably. And uh, we talked about offerings and sacrifices and the priesthood and the calendar of how those ideas are projected forward apocalyptically in light of the Day of Judgment, the resurrection of the dead, and the kingdom of God. And today, we want to continue our look in the Tanakh at the book of Numbers. And Numbers is, uh, yeah, it, it, there's a lot going on in this book. Um, it's really an interesting mishmash of stories of what happened with Israel in the wilderness as they left Mount Sinai and they begin wandering a bit. But then there's other instructions and things that are given. Long lists, lots of lists. Lots of lists in the book of Numbers. But we also want to use the book of Numbers and themes in the book of Numbers to have a, a, a good conversation on typology and what typology is. Uh, but before we get into that, before we get into these themes of how they're pushed forward towards the ultimate end in an apocalyptic framework, let's just do a quick overview of the book of Numbers. Yeah, so, you know, Numbers is kind of a mishmash of a bunch of different things that are happening. The first few chapters is the census and the, the arrangement of the camps. You have laws about the priests and the tabernacle in, in uh, chapters 5 through 9. You have the traveling and complaining in chapters 10 through 12. The spies so are, much complaining. So much complaining. The spies <laughs> are sent into Canaan, and then there's the rebellion against that in chapters 13 and 14, the rejection of... Uh, of their report and going in. Then you have the rebellion, Korah's rebellion in chapter 16, where the earth swallows up the rebellious priests. <laughs> That's a crazy story. <laughs> and uh, you have Aaron's staff budding in chapter 17. You have the water from the rock in chapter 20, the snake on the pole in 21. You got Balaam in chapters 22 through 24. You have the Baal worship in the census in chapter 25 and 26. And then the book ends with kind of a new generation uh, being prepped for entering the promised land in, in the last, whatever, nine chapters. And so, you know, there's a there's a ton of stuff happening in Numbers, which the Hebrew uh, title is uh, Bemidbar, which is meaning in the wilderness, uh, which I think is a better kind of <laughs> synopsis of What's going on? Yeah. It's a bunch of stuff happening in the wilderness before the promised land. Right. We we get the right. term numbers from uh, from the title in the Septuagint, arithmoi, uh, meaning numbers, and so that's from the Septuagint. We kind of inherited that, uh, but I think the better synopsis is there's a lot of stuff going on in the wilderness before the promised land, and it's a great kind of episode. Uh, there's no way to like split it up thematically or whatever. It's just, there's a whole lot of stuff happening and it's a great episode that I think we can, uh, focus in on the idea of a few of these events and, and things happening and, and how they become typological in Israel's tradition and then interpreted in the New Testament. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So let's just dive into a few of these. I think some of the things you mentioned, John, back in your little overview of the book of Numbers here. Today, we're going to talk about the manna, we'll talk about the snake on a pole, and we'll also talk about just generally the wanderings in the wilderness and how these themes get pushed forward apocalyptically through Second Temple literature and into the New Testament. So the first one here, let's talk about manna for a bit. I think we see this in chapter 11 uh, of the book of Numbers. Which again, manna, if you don't know the story, go read it in Numbers 11. It's God miraculously providing food for them when after they had complained, God said, all right, well, I'm going to provide for you. And and we know all the, the different details around that from Numbers 11, how God gave them enough for every single day and said, go out and gather 
get it daily. You're going to, uh, and then on, on the, the seventh day or on the sixth day, rather, you're going to grab enough for two days so that you can rest according to the commandment. And that's the basic story of manna in the book of Numbers. But this gets po- pushed forward apocalyptically, of course, uh, in Second Temple literature, and then used typologically in the New Testament as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Get, uh, the, the manna gets used a few times in the New Testament. Well, I, I think probably the clearest uh, connection with some of the, the Second Temple writings it would be the Lord's Prayer the, and the mention mm-hmm. of uh, the daily bread. Um, so we mentioned it I, in, in our first season. We mentioned um, something that we have in uh, Second Baruch 29, <clears throat> and uh, I'll just read. I'll just read part of Second Baruch twenty nine real quick. The earth will also yield fruit ten thousand fold, and on one vine there will be a thousand branches, and one branch will be produce a thousand clusters, and one cluster will produce a thousand grapes, and one grape will produce a core of wine. And those who are hungry will enjoy themselves, and they will moreover see marvels every day. Obviously, we're talking about the age to come and a restored earth, and it will happen. At that time, that the treasury of manna will come down again from on high, and they will eat of it in those years, because these are they that who will arrive at the consummation of time. And it will happen after these things, when the time of the appearance of the anointed one has been fulfilled, and he returns with glory, that those that... Uh, that then all who sleep in hope of him will rise, and it will happen at that time that those treasuries will be opened, in which the number of the souls of the righteous were kept, and they will go out, and the multitudes of souls will appear together in one assemblage of one mind. So uh, this is one of the pictures of the age to come, where they see the the historical event back in Numbers is it 11, Numbers 11, of the manna being provided in the wilderness as sort of typological of a future provision that God is going to... Uh, it's, a, it's a similar miracle that God will do of providing miraculously in the age to come. So it, it's, a, it's an interesting conversation. Again, probably gets caught up in... in Matthew, uh, Matthew six, and the Lord's Prayer, and also later on in John. But, but, uh, but again, we just want to point out that this is already how people were thinking and projecting about some of these things. Yeah, and in Matthew six, you know, the conclusion of the Lord's Prayer is, therefore, do not store up treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, Bingo. but store up treasures nice. in heaven. Where moth and rust do not destroy and break in, and and wherever your eye is set, whatever your focus is on, there's that's where your your heart will follow. And so, I think you know the 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 manna idea is closely connected to the heavenly treasuries, the storerooms, which are associated with the judgment and the dis- the disbursement of reward and punishment to the righteous and the wicked, and and so the manna you know also being referenced as the uh, the bread of angels i forget where that's at in the psalms psalm 78 i think it is psalm 78 bread of heaven so you get that same in in other places in jewish apocalyptic literature that that basically god was providing for the jews directly from heaven in the wilderness and this becomes kind of a pattern for the future that is going to ultimately that provision is manifest in the resurrection and the age to come and a glorious new earth. Right. So the same way, this is what Paul has in mind in Second Corinthians 5, after he talks about a light momentary affliction of this age, storing up for us an eternal weight of glory. Uh, and he says, for we know that if the tent that is our earthly homes destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And we groan inwardly, right, right. we groan now for our heavenly dwelling that we would be further clothed. And so he uses the language of we have a reward in the heavens that's waiting with God. 
And Paul probably has in mind literal treasuries in the heavenly realms. And there's, of course, books with specific angels assigned to those books and those treasuries and that are going to, you know, be opened at the judgment and everything's going to be exposed and laid bare. And it will all culminate at that point. But all of this kind of revolves around their view of the structure of the universe and their kind of... Uh, Israel's relationship with God is is framed within this context. And so manna is one particular point within all of that that is like uh, it it gets used later on as kind of a, a typological yeah. reality to express the provision of God throughout redemptive history leading up to its climactic end. Good. Yeah, because uh, the writers of the New Testament aren't aren't familiar with what we now might call Christian typology. So that, that kind of develops later uh, with some of the, uh, uh, the Christian apologists of the second and third century. But <clears throat> Midrash is a, is a Jewish typology um, that the writers of the New Testament were more familiar with, and, and it included typology where they saw historical narratives as, or at least within historical narratives, they saw them as um, events that were pointing to something in the future. So, so that's what what we have here in the in the manna. We have, you know, they see in the manna that narrative. They see that the story is not just about the story or the event. It's actually talking about something in the future. And often, like we've said by by writers in the in, in, in a lot of the Second Temple world, not, not everybody does it exactly the same, but writers in the Second Temple world, a lot of them had kind of these apocalyptic projections for their typology. So even, even some of the rabbis who don't tend to be overly apocalyptic, uh, this tradition about the manna continues on. Like um, in the Midrash Rabbah, uh, Ecclesiastes 1.9, um, as the first redeemer Moses caused manna to descend, as it is stated, because I shall cause rain or cause to rain bread from heaven for you in Exodus 16, so will the latter redeemer, the Messiah, cause manna to descend. That's an interesting, uh, interesting parallel to uh, John 6. Um, you will not find it. This is on the Melkita of Exodus 16. You will not find it in this age but you will find it in the age to come. It's a reference to manna. You will not find the manna any longer in this age, but you'll find it in the age to come. Again, lastly, in the Midrash Tanhuma, manna has been prepared for the righteous in the age to come. Everyone who believes is worthy and eats of it. So basically, these are interesting just to highlight. Again, we, we talked about this a little bit in the first season, but I just want to bring it up again to highlight that typology is is a thing, but what 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 matters here is is how you use it. Like what are, what are the events and the historical narratives pointing to? And I think man is a good example of something that is is essentially pressed forward eschatologically as a as something that'll take place in the age to come, both before the time of Jesus, like in Second Baruch, and also moving forward beyond that into the uh, Mishnaic and Talmudic times. That's that's a pretty cool example. Yeah, yeah. Well, and Bill, I mean, and John, you've mentioned this as well already. That even this word typology, I think it's important that we spend maybe a little bit of time talking about this, developing it, and of course, this is a prominent thing in the New Testament, typology is. But even understanding the difference, maybe we hear the word typology, maybe we have heard of the word allegory, and and I, I think it's important first just to clarify the distinction between these, right? So when we say typology, we're talking about historical events that point forward towards some kind of future apocalyptic events, especially in the New Testament. This is what we're talking about. Something that's allegorized or some an allegory, we're talking about historical events that point to some spiritual ideas or some secret hidden meaning, maybe in the Gnostic and because of the Alexandrian interpretation, the Alexandrian school. 
So, of course, the New Testament has a lot of typology. When we talk about, for instance, Jesus comparing himself with Jonah, or three days and three nights in the belly of a fish, right? Also, Noah and the flood, like uh, Jesus saying, as in the days of Noah, like in Matthew 24, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be, or 2 Peter 3, right? Uh, The flood came, and the flood points forward toward the greater judgment of fire on the day of the Lord. I think of another passage like Hebrews 8, where Jesus is identified as, as the greater priest. Adam, of course, gets mentioned quite a bit in the New Testament related to typology in passages like Romans 5 and 1 Corinthians 15, as the, the first man was made of dust, the second man is from heaven, all these ideas related to Adam. So typology is common in the New Testament. But the point is, how do we understand that typology? And I think to have a conversation about this uh, is really, really important. Yeah, uh, to to be specific, when we typology develops in Christian tradition, specifically within the Alexandrian uh, uh, tradition out of the Alex- Alexandrian school, uh, because Origen loved typology so much, so much love, <laughs> so much he loved it. But it derives from, for example, Romans five, where Paul says. Uh, Paul says, yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who, whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type, a tupos, of right. the one who was to come. And so it's not, it doesn't necessarily, typology doesn't necessarily mean everything points to the ultimate end. But it does right. mean that, that something historically points to something else historically in the future. Right. The confusion around typology is that something historically points to something else theologically that changes the basic narrative. The, something historical points to an ideological or a theological point. So like Origen, in his commentary on John, he says... We ought not to suppose that historical events are types of other historical events and material things of other material (laughs) things. Rather, material things are types of spiritual things and historical events of intelligible realities. So here, intelligible realities references Plato's worldview that the universe is split in two, material and material, and you have the intelligible world, intelligible forms or realities versus the uh, the physical world, the perceptual, uh, yeah. perceptual world that's composed of copies of those uh, uh, intelligible forms. And so he's kind of taking that worldview and that universe. Um, that became kind of the universe of the Western ideological tradition. But he's taking that universe and he's taking the idea of typology in the Bible and he's uh, mapping it onto that new worldview. And so this is where typology becomes. A lot of people will argue that typology is the beginning of Christian theology. And in a way, Sadly, it is. it is. But what happens is, is that basically you have supersessionism and typology becomes the primary tool for the new theological framework. It's, yep. the, yeah. it's the magic hat trick in which you take a historical event, you run it through this typological grinder, and all of a sudden you have a new theological narrative that comes out on the other end. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, it, and it makes me think of a quote by the late Catholic theologian Hans Urs von Balthasar, who says, There is no thinker who is as invisibly all present in the church as Origen. I mean, you just have to quake for a second at the thought that that might actually be true, yeah. right? And, and this idea of Origen, you know, because of this dualistic Platonic perspective, importing that way of seeing reality and taking all of these ideas in in terms of typology and in reinforcing some spiritual reality in terms of you know a historical to a historical reality uh, that's everywhere and is ubiquitous in Christian tradition yeah I think you know origins uh, influence is uh, more and more in the in the modern academy is is coming to light as far as yep. um, how much he influenced, even though there was a lot of controversy in his own day and he got rejected, but his influence on later thinkers, particularly 
uh, Augustine and his worldview yep. uh, really kind of dictated the theological tradition for the next 1,500 years after that. And so the way you kind of, in my mind, the way you kind of weed out typology is that you understand typology is shaped by eschatology. So whatever yeah. your eschatology is, whatever your end game is, then you take the historical events and people and it shapes and directs toward whatever eschatology you have. So Jews, their eschatology is the day of God, the resurrection, the age to come, the new heavens and new earth. And so all of redemptive history is pointing. It doesn't maybe necessarily point uh to the ultimate end, but it points to some historical reality in the future that ends up in relation to the ultimate end. And so it's historically oriented. Whereas for Origen, for example, you have a material and an immaterial world, and therefore his eschatology is escaping the material world to an eternal, ethereal, immaterial existence. Therefore, everything that happens historically is a typologically points to that ultimate eschatology of escaping the, the uh, material world. And as Origen would say, historical events point to, quote, spiritual realities. Right. So typology becomes the means by which, again, you said this earlier, John, but listeners, we, we definitely want to make sure you get this. Typology has become the means by which the narrative is flipped and altered rather than reinforced. Right. Yeah. And yeah, Origen, Origen is definitely the the guy who... Uh, Augustine made it more palatable, and that's probably why it's become so prominent, because Origen was just in a different universe. And so you listen... Maybe I'm the only one, but I read Origen, I just kind of imagine every paragraph is, you know, preceded by Clement handing him the, the hit or something that they're smoking at the time, because they just talk so different. But Augustine makes it a lot more palatable and uh, is also very big on the typology. But, um, <clears throat> but, but really, like we're saying, this is not... Typology isn't necessarily new to Christian tradition. It's just the way it's used, like John's highlighting. Like the rabbis... Right. Um, like I mentioned a couple of passages where they use typology actually generally, or not generally, but they use typology of the manna is projected forward as catalogically. And but at the same time, the 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 standard typological use uh, by the by the rabbinic tradition is halakhic typology. And so well they'll read a narrative and they'll find some sort of halakhic interpretation of, uh, or some sort of hidden meaning of uh, that's halakhic, or that's relating ultimately to the mitzvot, the the commands from the from the Torah. So, for our listeners, define what halakha is, if you so can. So, halakha is basically the it's it's it what it I mean what it basically means in that context is it's is it's the kind of authoritative view of the uh of the the commands of the torah kind of the instruction on how to live that's essentially authoritative or it's it's authoritative because it's the rabbinic view yeah i think you could think of uh, ha halakhic as concisely that which relates to the law and interpreting the law mm -hmm. yeah so the uh so the people and the events in the tanakh that second temple judaism interprets as pointing to the age to come. Um, a lot of ways, um, those those are interpreted in the New Testament. A lot of times they're interpreted as referring to the Messiah. But like, like John said, your eschatology really determines how you use typology. And so if, if you have a Messiah that is a personalized Messiah, and that's kind of what a Messiah is, is a Messiah is somebody that lives in your heart and has a sweet, you know, uh, quiet time with you in the morning and guides you throughout your day and make sure that you're successful in your business ventures, then that's what typology <laughs> is pointing to. Right. And so uh, that's one of the things we want to we kind of highlight is that 
what we see in Origen is different than what we see in the rabbis, and then what we see in Augustine is slightly different than Origen. And the point is, is that the as the sensibilities change over time, that is how we see typology mobilized. Is like you see it again in Justin in his dialogue with Trifo, who's a Jew, is they're basically arguing back and forth, which Trifo, I, I don't even know if Trifo is a historical dude. I mean, it's basically he's a big straw man that right. Justin just kind of right. pushes over. He's a... He's kind of a stereotypical right. Jew, but a so bad, a bad stereotypical Jew. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's awful, <laughs> awful. He's just such a bumbling idiot, Trifo. <clears throat> but and so you, uh, they're, they're basically the dialogue is how what is the correct way to interpret or use typology, and so Justin is simply defining it according to. The, the current climate and the messianic claims that the that Christians had at the time, because, you know, what, what's important changes. Like in the first century, the, he's the Messiah of Israel is a big deal, but he's the Messiah of Israel according to a Jewish concept, right? But by the time you get to the second century with leaders like Justin, being a Messiah is a totally different thing. Like, and so he's kind of defending something else with typology, or Augustine, when you get to the reason he sounds differently is because you get to the early 5th century and his writing of the city of God, and what he needs to defend is the glory of the church right after the fall of, of Rome. And so he's, he uses typology to ex- basically explain the glory and the significance of the church. And, and so you use typology according to your eschatology, where you think things are headed and what you think is important. That's how you mobilize typology, and that's been done consistently in history. Yeah, yeah. So I think you you know you, typology is bound together with hermeneutics, and all of that, like you're saying, Bill, is uh, really determined by what your end game is. And so you can think of eschatology as you know a lot of times it's nationalistic throughout the history of of Christianity, it becomes ethnocentric, right? And so it's whatever, it's Rome, it, it, right. it's the Roman Empire, and the city of God is right. based in Rome. After it falls, then it's the church, and it's whatever national reality that the church is centered in, or different, you know, you have different ethnocentric and you get the interpretation of the scriptures all leading up to the glorification of whatever people group it is or whatever partic- particular nation or ethnos. And so they read passages like Second Chronicles 7, and if you'll repent and turn and humble yourself, I'll heal your land, speaking of whatever country they're particularly in. And the eschatology of whatever people are driving towards in that situation is the glorification of that nation or people, and therefore all the types, when they read the events of Israel wandering in the wilderness, or the Psalms, or the prophetic literature, then they end up reading the end of that as our people and our nation. Mine in particular being the glory right. of of the Irish crew, or mine and Bill, sorry. And so, <laughs> but, you know... You you have all kinds of dynamics that begins to, you know, and you can have even more than ethnocentric hermeneutics and eschatology. You can have egocentric hermeneutics and eschatology, mm-hmm. particularly after the, after the Enlightenment, in which our own personal individual happiness is our eschatology. That's our end game. Yep. And that's all yeah. everything is yeah. unto, and that's all God ultimately really wants, is for us to be happy and awesome. And therefore, the scriptures all point to us and our individual glorification and happiness. And so whenever it's talking about the the desert wanderings and the Psalms and the prophetic literature, and thus the Messiah, that's what Messiahs do. They die on crosses for me. And therefore, all right. of Israel's <laughs> redemptive history is talking about me and my own personal life <laughs> and my walk with God and seven keys to my personal happiness and glorification. And that's how it ends up kind of playing out in you know a real practical way for a lot of people when they read their Bible day in and day out. Yep, yep. 
I could really use a personal exodus right now. <laughs> right this on. Me. That's what I'm that's talking it. about. And that's how it goes, right? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly how it goes. Breakthrough. Breakthrough, Bill. You mean a breakthrough. <laughs> So much of this is, you know, here we are in the West and and there's just, at least in my world here in the South in, in Texas, it's a mix of all of the above. It's the Bible points to America and its awesomeness and the Bible points to me and my awesomeness. And, and it waffles and fluctuates like a pendulum between one direction, it's one way, one time it's one way and one time it's another way. And, and then it's a mix of the two. It's because America was built on the philosophy of the sovereignty of the individual. Right. So it's basically the same thing. Right. There you go. So that's why we can exalt America, because America is also all about me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> let's move on from the snark the snarkasm. Let, let yeah, let's move on. So so back to the mana point, guys, and how the Jews understood mana pressed forward eschatologically. I think of a passage like John six, which is you know, another one of these really crazy passages that gets interpreted individually or spiritually or whatever through the strange Alexandrian typological lens. But John 6, again, if we're talking about the point you made earlier, John, the heavenly treasure rooms that are going to be opened at the judgment, the resurrection, and the manna, treasury of manna being opened again on the day of judgment, on the day of the Messiah, that gives so much context to the passage in John 6, where Jesus would say the famous statement, I am the bread of life. Yeah, so John 6 is great because you have a questioning of whether or not Jesus is the Messiah, and uh, Jesus talking about his own work in relation to the Father, and that they should believe he's the Messiah because of the works that he's done. And they say, what sign will you give that we may believe you? Our fathers ate manna in the wilderness, verse 31. As it's written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And then Jesus responds and says, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. Right, So you have a typological, the bread in the desert in Numbers 11 has a true or a greater typological historical pointing forward uh, uh, reality, the true bread from heaven, which is the Messiah, the provision of God to bring us through to the promised land of the new heavens and new earth, which he described at the end of chapter 5, being given authority to raise the dead, to judge the wicked, etc., And he says, for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And then he says, they say, Lord, give us this bread. He says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall not thirst. So there's not like a a strange mystical dynamic. He's just interpreting Israel's history as pointing forward to the greater complex uh, consummation at the end, and and in nobody's mind is Jesus changing the narrative. Right, right. He's just simply talking within the commonly understood Jewish po- apocalyptic narrative, and that's the theological framework within which typology is understood. Exactly. Great. Yeah, it's true. It, it because Jesus. It, it so what it highlights is that they're actually familiar with typology already, and. But secondly, like, how is Jesus known? And Jesus is generally known amongst his contemporaries as an apocalyptic preacher. And right. and so this is the way he generally, I mean, read the Sermon on the Mount. Right. Ma- Matthew 6, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, read Luke 6. Jesus interprets the, the, the Torah according to these apocalyptic convictions. And so this is how Jesus' teachings always work. And so... Mm-hmm. But he, when he continues, like in verse thirty-three, uh, for the he explains. Uh, oh no, you just read verse thirty-three, right? But then a little, little bit later on, he says the same. For this is the will of my Father that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Defining what eternal life is. Truly, truly, I say to you, he says uh, just below verse 47, 48, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life, I am the bread of life. So the whole thing, Jesus is simply interpreting the manna really in a similar way that Second Baruch is, is that it, it is emblematic or it's typological of God's provision in the age to come 
of eternal life. And that's kind of how it's used, right? Like in Second Baruch, it's talked about, you know, it, it kind of is emblematic of the provision of God to live eternally and to have unlimited provision, like all the thousands of grapes and all of that. And so he's just using it in the same way. The typology has the exact same hope and end game as Second Baruch 29. And eternal life here means to be raised up on the last day. So Jesus is using it the same way. It's not... There's no Catholic Jesus here. It's 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 straightforward, <laughs> apocalyptic Jewish Jesus. Amen. Yeah. So the bit about eating his flesh and drinking his blood is kind of a continuation. It's not, and that is provocative. Yeah. You have people wanting to leave at that point, but at least that provocative saying is understood plain within the context of the plain Jewish apocalyptic reading right yes. before that, right? So he kind of concludes that passage with verse 49, your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. So then he makes the transition into, if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part of me and but it's frame it's that's in context to the plain straightforward discussion that they just had about he is the greater bread of life and the greater manna and that he is the messiah and if you don't believe in him you're not going to inherit the resurrection uh right. and and eternal life and so then he kind of makes the transition to if you don't feed on him and have faith in him as the Messiah, not just the one who's going to raise you and glorify you, but is the one who's going to die according to the scriptures. So there's the transition to the death of the Messiah that then is the thing that turns them off. But the discussion of his blood is understood in light of his flesh in relation to the manna understood typologically. So the whole discussion happens within a Jewish apocalyptic context. There's not a an introduction of some foreign theological narrative in the in in the uh, conversation. So important to see. Yeah. That's great guys. Well, since we're here in John, I suppose we could back up a little bit and talk about another theme that is pushed forward eschatologically and apocalyptically from the book of Numbers that's also seen in John's gospel, and that's the snake on a pole from Numbers 21. And this is just another story you can see in Numbers 21 where the people are impatient with God and they complain, and then the Lord sends these fiery serpents among the people, and then they acknowledge their sin, and then the Lord says to Moses, Moses, make a fiery serpent, this is Numbers 21, verses 8 and 9, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole, and if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. Yeah, so he, Jesus references this point in John 3, where he says in verse 14, and Moses, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And so then he goes on to interpret that event in numbers in light of redemptive history in a greater sense. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, the Messiah, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So the same way that God provided the provision for salvation from death with the Israelites in the wilderness, he's doing it a greater sense in redemptive history with Israel's Messiah to save them from the greater death or the second death as Gehenna uh, came to be known in Second Temple literature uh, to save them from the second death so that they might inherit eternal life. So again, it's it's a referencing of the event in the wilderness with the pole to illustrate the greater reality in uh, uh, redemptive history, but both of which are presumed within an apocalyptic context. Yeah. Even among all of this, I think it's important to say again that and we've mentioned this before, that it's not like the snake on a pole and the manna didn't mean anything back 
in the Exodus or in the wilderness. It it meant something. It had and and that's what gives yeah. it its meaning apocalyptically. Like if if we just had the idea that we just said, oh well, you know, it just whatever it was, it just the Lord put the snake on the pole and the Lord gave man and the people were like, oh, I wonder what this means. Hmm. <laughs> and then all of a sudden the New Testament authors come along and say, oh, it's just all pointing to Jesus, as if it didn't mean anything back then. Right. Good point. And then it finally has some spiritual meaning in the future. No, the only thing that gives it its meaning apocalyptically for the Jews in the in the Second Temple period and in the first century is because it had a meaning back in the wilderness. Right. That's a great point, Josh. Good point to keep coming back to that. <clears throat> um, and and I, I think uh, what you know, one of the things if you if you do John three, son of man must be lifted up like the serpent, then you then it almost sounds like there's some sort of like again kind of like the the manna if you if you're not familiar with the manna conversation in second baruch and another rabbinic tradition you you get to john 6 and you go whoa jesus is just pulling this out of nowhere and but that's not the case right, right? and the same thing here um like the 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 lifting up of the Son of Man in John twelve, it's used again, but there it's real explicitly the um, it's the cross, right? He's, he's the lifting up is a reference to the manner in which he's going to die, being raised up on a cross because they used to have to uh, they they nail you down when you were on the ground and then they'd lift it up, and also in John eight is the same thing, the lifting up of the Son of the Man, and so when he brings in the snake, he seems to be connecting the lifting up idea to the snake. It, and 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 so the cross is basically the idea. And so, again, you think, oh, so is Jesus just kind of like pulling this out of nowhere? Well, here, here's a couple of ideas that were already floating around about the snake and what it implied. Like wisdom, and the wisdom of Solomon, uh, chapter 16, verses 5 through 11. <clears throat> uh, let's see, for when he, he... So it's basically going to give a commentary on that episode in Numbers. For when the terrible rage of wild animals came upon your people, and they were being destroyed by the bites of writhing serpents, your wrath did not continue to the end. They were troubled for a little while as a warning, and received a symbol of deliverance to remind them of your law's command. For the one who turned to it was saved, not by the thing that was beheld, but by you, the Savior of all. So here, the Savior of all is is God, is the Father, that God provided a means for them to be saved. And by looking at that thing, they were actually looking to Yahweh, the Savior. And then you get in verse 8 here, And by this also you convinced our enemies that it is you who deliver from every evil. For they were killed by the bites of locusts and flies, and no healing was found for them because they deserved to be punished by such things. The idea is that they didn't look to you. But your children were not conquered, even by the fangs of venomous serpents, for your mercy came to their help and healed them. Listen to this. This is verse 11. To remind them of your oracles, they were bitten, and then were quickly delivered, so that they would not fall into deep forgetfulness. And so the idea is, it's they were, they were bitten so that they would look to God as the Savior, reminding them of the oracles. That's what it was typological yeah. of. And, and so this is written within 100 years before Jesus, 50 to 100 years before the time of Jesus. So, so this is already connected to basically it has a meaning of looking to God as the Redeemer in context to the future, in context to the future oracles. And one of the Targums of the time has a similar, there's a fragmentary Targum that says, and anyone who is bitten, this is the, the commentary on the passage in Numbers, Anyone who was bitten by the serpent would raise his face in prayer towards his father in heaven and would look at the serpent and he would live. And so the idea is the looking at the serpent was a way of turning the heart to God and submitting to the oracles of God. And then in that context, you would be restored to life. And so for Jesus to place his cross in that context, is not a stretch by any means to the already existing conversation about the typology of the serpent. That's an important thing to know about the about what's going on there. Yeah. 
Right. And so Jesus, you know, in John 3, when it says, following that in verse 17, for God did not send his son, which son of God is is phraseology for the son of of David. It, it's interchangeable mm-hmm. and uh, often yep. gets uh, in the New Testament, Messiah and Son of God are used in tandem together. You are the Messiah, the Son of God. And so, so that's what they have in mind, that uh, God did not send His Son, the Messiah, into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he was not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And so it's Jesus isn't saying that the previous expectation of the coming of the Messiah to judge the living and the dead, to raise the dead, which he goes on in chapter 5 to describe. He's not saying that that has been changed. He's just saying the Son of God did not come into the world initially, this time, to judge the world, but to save the world from the coming judgment and the wrath to come. And so, the discussion of what's happening to the Messiah now and God's ordaining him for crucifixion to be lifted up like the snake on the pole is happening within the overarching preconceived Jewish apocalyptic narrative, the two ages, the day of judgment, the resurrection, etc. But what ends up happening throughout Christian history is that the typological use gets taken out of a Jewish apocalyptic narrative and inserted into some other Gentile narrative, whether it be kind of a Hellenistic heavenly destiny narrative or kind of a Roman Constantinian dominionistic narrative or some sort of weird mystical uh, narrative in some of the monastic movements or whatever the context is. The typology is used as the mechanism to say that, oh, that Jewish narrative has now changed, and this is now how Jesus is introducing a new interpretive method of typology to change the narrative and introduce the new one. Yeah, John, I think that's so important to remember and so important to keep in mind, a continuing Jewish apocalyptic narrative in light of this, especially as we read scriptures that are so familiar, John 3, John 6, to many here in the West. Well, let's move on to our final theme here uh, that we want to look at from the book of Numbers. And that, I suppose you could just sum it up as the general wilderness wanderings of the people of Israel, right? Like this is how Numbers is presenting uh, all of these events. They're wandering in the wilderness, they're complaining, and, and just the way that even the book of Numbers is reflected on in Second Temple literature and in the New Testament, can just be traced back to their wanderings in the wilderness, right? So I think uh, even the prophetic material develops this a bit throughout uh, Isaiah, Ezekiel, uh, and, and other prophets. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, like you said, Isaiah, Isaiah uses it... Uh kind of to talk, to talk about eschatology, pressing it forward. Ezekiel does the same. Hosea does the same too. Yeah. Like Hosea 2 compares it to like like uh, like the first wilderness, as I betrothed myself to you, so I'm going to make an everlasting covenant with you in the wilderness in the future. And um, mm. Ezekiel does the same thing in Ezekiel 20. Um, if you're familiar, Ezekiel 20, like the first section of Ezekiel 20 essentially goes through the history, the actual history of Israel's wanderings and interprets it as how God was responding to them. And then it projects it forward eschatologically, beginning in uh, verse 33, as I live, declares the Lord God, surely with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out, I will be king over you. And so the idea is that you haven't let me fully be king over you but you will. Um, I will bring you out from the peoples and gather you out of the countries where you are scattered with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out. So the context, of course, here is exile, an exile to a variety of countries. And he says, and I will bring you into the wilderness of the peoples, and there I will enter into judgment with you face to face. And so the wilderness of the peoples or the wilderness of the nations is essentially referencing this this exile, this future exile from which if you read on 
it's a conclusive end to the kind of exile motif and cycle. So right. the conclusive right. end will will be when the Lord encounters them in this place that he's connected. It's basically an exile, but he's calling it the wilderness of the nations. So it's like they were wandering outside longing for the promised land. So it will be as they're wandering in exile before the Messiah's coming. And so he's going to basically continue on in that passage. But the whole point is that he's already using the wilderness motif as kind of a, as a symbol for future exile. Yeah, and th- this gets uh, you know kind of assumed in the New Testament as the exile continues until the day of God and the coming of the Messiah. And so yeah. you have in 1 Corinthians 9 a great example where Paul assumes uh, the wanderings of numbers as typological of the exile of uh, of the Jews in light of the coming restoration and the kingdom and the resurrection. And so he talks about he gives his whole life as an apostle to see people saved from the coming judgment to inherit the resurrection. He runs like a runner in a race, not to receive a perishable wreath, but an imperishable one. He beats his body and keeps it under control so that he doesn't become disqualified at the judgment. And then he says, our fathers were all under the same cloud. We, our fathers went through the sea. Our fathers were baptized into Moses, the same spiritual food, the same spiritual drink. And so you have, he uses spiritual to talk about a kind of typological approach to these events that are happening in the book of Numbers that are projecting forward, that he's projecting forward to the greater redemptive narrative. But for Paul, that redemptive narrative remains apocalyptic. He's using it in light of the 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 imperishable wreath of the resurrection in chapter 9. And so he says in verse 6, verse 5, Nevertheless, with most of them God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things took place as an exam- as examples for us, that we might not desire evil as they did. And then he goes on to describe their evils of idolatry, of sexual immor- immorality, of testing the Lord, uh, and they're destroyed by serpents in verse 9, the same story, nor grumble as many of, the, of them did, and they're destroyed. He says, verse 11, now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. And so Paul, of course, didn't mean that the age to come was spiritually being realized somehow with him. Right. He's simply saying, that the end of the age, the the day of Christ Jesus, the, the coming of the Messiah with angels and fire, the resurrection is upon us. It's near at hand. Yeah, yeah, that was yeah. that was how he viewed things at the time. He viewed it innocently. He he didn't he didn't realize how it was gonna unfold. And and we take that the same way. We don't know how it's gonna unfold, but we assume that the end of the age, the day of God, is at hand for us, and we live under the same sobriety, and we take that same sobriety and we apply it to the scriptures apocalyptically, and therefore we respond the same way that Paul did based on that att- interpretive approach that we discipline our lives and say no to the flesh, and we live in restraint so that we're not disqualified at the coming of Christ Jesus and at the judgment. Yeah, absolutely, John. I mean, this is why it matters that we maintain an apocalyptic hermeneutic and apocalyptic typology as the Jews in the first century did. This is an issue of discipleship. And, you know, we've talked about this so much, even in the end of every episode on our first season, our little so what and why Paul really is trying to drive home the point, as you're saying, John, of self-discipline, of laying down your life, of taking up your cross, of walking in humility, of looking forward towards the day of Christ Jesus in light of actually receiving the reward of eternal life. I mean, in the context here in 1 Corinthians 9 and 10 is super clear, right? 
And, and the reason why he's interpreting the desert wanderings in this way and typologically is because he's reinforcing that that is the kind of discipleship that is needed to obtain the imperishable wreath, to actually inherit eternal life on the last day. Right. Really, in so many ways, like the, the lackluster discipleship here in the West, in my opinion, is because much of us here in the West are not reinforcing that end game, that apocalyptic day of the Lord, day of judgment, resurrection, age to come, Messiah on a throne in Jerusalem, the wicked thrown into Gehenna, the righteous rewarded with eternal life forever. And and again, when you read 1 Corinthians 10 in this context, with this understanding, it's super, super clear. Yeah, I agree. And, uh, you know, it, the, another reason why it matters is because you, you ultimately interpret the Bible and life through the same lens. And so, yeah. it, you know, in 1 Corinthians 10, like John was just reading, like, obviously this follows, uh, or, or it, you know, Paul, Paul wrote in uh, 1 Corinthians 4 and 2 Corinthians 4 and 5, and he's explaining also as an example to them how he's also interpreting his own life. Because he interprets, because he interprets the Scripture that way, it's natural that he interprets the Scripture that way, because that's where his hope's at. But it also causes him to interpret life in the same manner, and he's able to interpret life with these light and momentary afflictions versus these things that are just this, they're a rival and a challenge to my well-being and the blessing that God wants to bring me right now. And so it's it's not just a hermeneutic. It actually is the way that we view life. Yeah, and I think it it... It provides an example for how we conform our life to the narrative of the Scripture rather than conforming the narrative of the Scripture to our own life. Yeah, that's right. The Scripture doesn't speak about me, but it may speak to me, right? But I'm, I'm part of that uh, storyline. I'm part of that reality. That reality doesn't bend and conform itself to me. But by the mercy of God... I'm in the same context in this age as the Jewish people were some 3,500-ish years ago, and we all have the same dynamics uh, that we're dealing with. And so that's why Paul concludes right. in the next verse, Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that it is not common to man. God is faithful, and He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, He will also provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. And so the same temptations that they're dealing with in the book of Numbers are common to all human beings, even if they lived in ancient times, a different worldview, different cultural historical context. We're all humans plagued with mortality, with predispositions towards wicked thoughts and behaviors, susceptible to demonic influence and all of our own insecurities and whatever, whatever. And the one thing that Paul uses to deal with all of that is the apocalyptic framework of redemptive history and the hope of the resurrection and eternal life. And that is how you deal with that which is common to man. And so when you pull that out of the equation, then you just end up train wrecking the entire discipleship process. That's good. Amen, guys. Well, I think this has been a great overview of some of the events of, of numbers uh, and how they're pushed forward apocalyptically by Second Temple authors and the authors of the New Testament, how they just maintain this Jewish apocalyptic framework uh, for the scriptures, and uh, how it's important that we continue to do that too if we want to be disciples that ultimately will inherit eternal life on the last day. So, well, great to be with you, John and Bill. Listeners, we're going to continue our look at the Tanakh next week. We're going to get into Deuteronomy a bit, and uh, there's much to talk about in Deuteronomy. So, Uh, Be sure to come back and join us then. But until then, thanks for listening to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. God bless and Maranatha. Maranatha, folks. Maranatha. Thanks for listening to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. For more, visit us on our website at apocalypticgospel.com and follow us on Twitter at Apocalyptic Gospel. 